Production funding for Behind the Headlines is made possible in part by... Yuletide Office Solutions, locally owned and family operated, offering office supplies and furniture, office design services, school supplies, and more. The Yuletide team proudly supports the Bartlett Area Chamber of Commerce and WKNO. The WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Senators Mark Norris and Lee Harris on the upcoming legislative session tonight on Behind the Headlines. I'm Eric Barnes, publisher of the Memphis Daily News. Thanks for joining us. I'm joined tonight by Mark Norris, Majority Leader in the State Senate. Thanks for being here. Great to be back. Thanks, Eric. And Lee Harris, Minority Leader in the State Senate. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having us. And Bill Drees, Senior Reporter with the Memphis Daily News. And of course, both of you represent different parts of Shelby County. I should note that also. But I'll start really with, and I'll start with the, the Senior Senator. Uh, the priorities for the upcoming session for you. Priorities remain the same. The budget is job one, as is the case every year. But as for me, I continue focusing on education, employment, and economic opportunity. A lot of that flows from the budget. There are a lot of ancillary issues that are important to us individually and to our constituents. But um, funding the state and the programs that are needed is job one. All right, we'll get, and we'll dive deeper into all of that, but your priorities just at the outset here. No, I think that's right. I think that job, job creation, job training programs, education, the budget, uh, we've got a little um, overhang from the last session, of course, with respect to judicial nominations and how we're going to proceed forward on that. So I think a lot of the things that we did last time will come up again, some of them, but uh, jobs and economic development, of course, education are important. And, and there is projections right now of quite a large budget surplus over the next couple of years, which is, I mean, we've had some surplus. We're talking, you know, projections ranging from 300 million to 500 plus million for each of the two years. I mean, right. and will it be, you know, Christmas at, at the Capitol and all kinds of new spending programs, or will it be uh, reductions or putting away in the rainy day fund? I mean, what's the big picture of that that possible surplus in this? improving economy. Everything with the exception of Christmas, let's yeah. put it that way. Um, whenever you have um, more money, it's much more difficult because as the governor says, there's, it's competition between a lot of good ideas. They're very rarely any poor ideas that people seek for funding. So we'll be somewhere um, north of, of a half a billion dollars, which is a good thing. It shows we've done a good job in, um, in, in budgeting. You'd rather have too much than too little. But then what the priorities become, and, and I think Senator Harris and I agree, we, we're hopeful that we can direct a fair share of that to, to jobs and, and training. Does it, is that in part transportation? Obviously, the, 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 the Haslam administration, you know, it's a funny thing, when the session ends in April, May, then the, the, the governor goes through the summer and into the fall laying out these priorities and initiatives, some that he can do, some that he's teeing up for the next session. Transportation is a big one. And they've talked about, I mean, I've read estimates from 6 to $11 billion backlog of roads, bridges, all that sort of thing. I mean, is that... There's talk of a gas tax. There's talk of the, the state doesn't borrow, and I don't think anybody's going to go into a borrowing situation. But this surplus, is some of that going to be routed to transportation and this big backlog, particularly in Shelby County? Well, I think we'll have to see. I mean, certainly on my side of the aisle, we want to talk about infrastructure. We'd love to talk about it. I mean, I think it's important in Shelby County, one of the major important projects, of course, the Lamar Avenue project, which is an expensive project, which can't be done without significant state help. And, of course, we've got to find a revenue source for that. Uh, and so on my side of the aisle, we'll certainly be proposing ways to fund infrastructure reform. Uh, now, whether or not that gets any momentum, uh, it's tough to say for now. But, Does of course, it, the governor has supported it. No, or the governor certainly supported the idea, generally speaking, right. uh, and taking a tour, uh, you know, to, to kind of see if he could drum up some support for that. Uh, so I think we should have a debate on it, and we'll see where it goes. What about a gas tax or an increase in the gas tax, which, has, people probably know, hasn't been increased in 20-something years, and as yeah. cars become more efficient, less revenue comes off that gas tax. And there's actually pretty broad popular support according to a to a Vanderbilt poll. Yeah, there's another battle on my side of the aisle. There is there is some support for a gas tax increase if it's going to be used for infrastructure re reform. The only additional point that we'd make is that we should also really think hard about public transit. And so there are public yeah. transit needs across the state. Uh, of course, MATA here in Memphis right. uh, has has had a lot of initiatives right. that were were left on the shelf. Rapid transit to work to to to, to jobs and so forth were left on the shelf because there right. weren't the funds in place. You've expressed some hesitation about. Out of gas tax. Eric, that's a, that's a great point that, that Lee makes about 
other forms of transportation, for exa example, public transportation. That's sort of been my, my point is hesitation about a gas tax. We're not going to do a gas tax in 2016. We're going to have to address it soon enough. And these conversations are very important because a lot of people, you know, gas tax funds just one thing. We've also got public transportation. Yeah. We've got rivers, roads, rails, runways. Um, there's more to it than just the gas tax. Dollars. But where, and then we're going to build, where, yeah. where does the funding come from if it doesn't come from a tax? Well, the first, the first thing that has happened is that the feds have now, as we speak, finally adopted a new okay. uh, Surface Transportation Act. Rather than a continuing resolution, they came up with something that's a little bit better. That gives us sort of a baseline to, to yeah. understand. When, when Governor Haslam began talking about this at the beginning of the summer, we didn't know where the federal government was, what it was going to do with its portion of the gas tax. So we have a better idea on that now. Um, revenues come in in different ways. Diesel is taxed differently than, than gas. Um, as it relates to, to airports, for example, that, that formula is different. So we have to take a comprehensive look. But public transportation is always a very important issue to us in the, in the urban areas. It's, it's less so uh, to many of the legislators from from yeah. the other Some 94 counties. Some of downright hostility to public transportation. Sometimes. Um, I've, I've worked with the public uh, transportation group very well over a number of years. I used to chair the, the Senate Transportation Committee and propose some different revenue yeah. sources uh, at the time. But for now, the other factor is we want folks to be able to take advantage of the, the low gas prices. Yeah. I filled up for like $1.67 <laughs> this week. And so as people listen to this, um, take advantage of it. Tuck those, tuck those pennies away. Um, we are coming out of that great recession and people are putting yeah. that money to use. But, but it'll change okay. in the future. I just don't think it's going to be in 2016. Okay, Bill. And, and, and the governor has said he doesn't know when he will propose whatever he's, he's going to propose on that. Um, but if we have this north of half a billion dollar surplus that, that we're looking at, that's one-time money. Road projects tend to be one-time money as well uh, in most cases, in terms of building a road, in terms of doing like the interchanges that are planned for Lamar Avenue. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so do, do, do we bank that money that, that we have that's a surplus now to, for the day when we do figure out how we're going to pay for it? As, as the sponsor of the budget, um, it's, it's my feeling that we should bank some of that money in this year's budget. Um, some people look at this in terms of restoring funds that were diverted under the Bredesen administration, mm -hmm. uh, several hundred million dollars there. Uh, I think to get to a meaningful long-term solution at some point, we're gonna to have to repay some of those funds, and I think we'll begin doing that in 2016. Lee, what's your philosophy on, on that half billion dollars that, that, that you all have? Do you bank some of it? Do you No, I think there's no doubt, about it. <clears throat> no doubt about it. Some of it has to go in a rainy day fund, and I think that that's where some of it will, will, will end up. Uh, the good thing about it is, is that I think the governor is committed to having a dialogue about what we do with surplus funds. He's done it before, uh, and he's been really inclusive and made sure to listen to a lot of different perspectives uh, and to bring in a lot of folks. Uh, and so I'm hopeful that he'll do that again. Every, every expectation I have is that he'll do that again, and we'll be able to come to some conclusions, you know, as, as far as we can. Uh, some agreement about how to spend the surplus resources, but this is a better place to be than, of course, when I was on the city council and you know, and other <laughs> organizations that face you know really severe deficits. Mm. So, uh, go go ahead, Mark. No, I, that's right, and I think Governor Haslam has has each year gotten even better about being inclusive and trying to find out what's on the minds of of individual members and individual caucuses, you know, like our Shelby legislative delegation. So. It's a good process. Really. Uh, where are we in terms of tax cutting? I mean, at the state level, we don't have an income tax, obviously, but the estate tax, is that being phased out? I've, I've forgotten, yeah, yeah, quite the, honestly. But the, that, I guess this is more impetus to get rid yeah, of that. Yeah, 2016 is the grand finale for yeah. that. So. Any other taxes that are, uh, will be on deck to maybe get rid of? There's always talk about further reductions to the hall tax. There's Which several, is the investment tax. That's, that's right, the, yeah. the unearned income, as they right. call it. And so uh, what what the we had preferred to do over a period of time is to continue to raise the exemption uh, on the hall tax for 65 year olds and older. That's something that, that Lieutenant Governor Ron Ramsey began years ago and each year ratcheting it up. Now we have several bills that have been filed to just repeal the hall yeah. tax. The challenge is that a, a lot of funding for local governments comes from that 
revenue stream. Yeah. And uh, so there, there, there's there are collateral effects that have to be okay. accounted for and dealt with. Okay, Bill. Um, I, I want to go back to, to the federal action on road projects. It, it, did that, in effect, change the the urgency or the time frame of our state discussion about road projects? Here's what it does from my perspective. First of all, it tells us, for better or for worse, that they did not choose to raise the federal component of the gas tax, the 18-some cents. Um, so we know that, that that's off the table in terms of whether we raise it somewhere down the road. You know, you, you always be afraid if you raised it five cents here and then the feds came in and raised their component. Well, what's the, what's the total there? And you didn't have any way of knowing. We're beyond that. Secondly, it does provide a relief valve for the Department of Transportation because now they can budget against what they know they will receive in federal funds over the next five or six years, whereas that was uncertain at the beginning of the summer. They didn't know if there would be any new funding coming in. So, so they can quantify better. The, the, the talk about a $6 billion backlog doesn't translate into things that, that my constituents and Senator Harris's constituents immediately understand. And that's, that's one of the critiques I've given the Haslam administration. We need more time to articulate more clearly exactly how the funding works and how it's going to be used. A $6 billion backlog doesn't, doesn't mean anything to, yeah. to, to real people. Mm -hmm. Well, let's, a budget consideration, moving on from roads and so on, is, is the, this effort that the Haslam administration has uh, announced over the summer and the fall of privatization, privatization in Arizona parks, I think, and also at the university's maintenance and so on. What's your take on this push towards privatization? And that follows years of moving in Memphis, most notably, you know, moving the state out of a state-owned building, the state offices here downtown, into a, a, a private building where they pay rent. There's this privatization push. What's your take on this new push? Um, well, the, our, our latest take is that we should take more information and we should try to figure out what's going on. The vast majority of college campuses will be affected by the privatization proposal. Uh, and right now, a lot of that proposal is being instigated and pushed by a, a small hand, a handful of consultants. Uh, and while I trust consultants a great deal, I really want to know what's going on on the ground. Right. And so what we've suggested on my side of the aisle is that we should get out of, of Nashville and, uh, you know, get out of committee hearings and briefings and just really go find out what's going on on the ground uh, and where right. there's areas of improvement. And if there are areas of improvement, then obviously we should talk about it. But the case hasn't been made quite yet. And right. so I think we're a long way from the case being made. And when you look at, you know, like you say, examples in Memphis, some would say that those are, uh, you know, uh, are, not, are, are not successes. Uh, the fact that the state moved out of a building downtown, which in, in some respects was a good right. building and pretty usable, and moved into another building where the state is now paying rent and still has to, you know, maintain the building downtown or right. figure out how to, you know, reorient right. that building. Uh, so it hasn't been successful in the isolated cases we've had in, in the city of Memphis, uh, and some would say in the city of Chattanooga there are other examples uh, where, you know, you could, you, could, you could quibble about whether or not it's been successful. Right. And, and right now we're going through a process that's not open to all commerce who want to deliver information and, and right. try to really uh, make sure we make an informed decision. This privatization push, are you, are you in support of it? I, I still haven't been given any, any uh, information by the administration yeah. as to what they have in mind. I've, I've learned a little bit more as it relates to parks, perhaps. But um, they've kept it very close to the vast. And the first proposal of, for people to come in, I don't think anybody bid on it, right? I mean, they put not a proposal. Not for the parks. That's, right. for the that's parks. my understanding. Yeah. So there's clearly some confusion, and maybe they just need you guys to figure out what you're going to put right. in terms so of Right. So I've money been asked and... frequently about the privatization, and, right. and what did I think about the governor's request for information, or whatever they called mm -hmm. it, the RFI. And I said, I, yeah. I think an RFI is fine. Right. Uh, it's what he does with the information he gets once he gets it that, that right. will concern Senator right. Harris and me, and I have no idea at this point because we haven't consulted about we, it. We mentioned universities. That there's a proposal out there uh, for University of Memphis and other to get their own board of regents. You work for the University of Memphis. There's a law professor. I should note that. So you have some bias in it uh, <laughs> that we need to <laughs> disclose. Um, but your take on that, I mean, is that, an, is that appropriate? I mean, a lot of people have pushed for that kind of independence for a long time. No, I think it's appropriate. I mean, if you're going to give responsibility to the university, you've got to give it some powers. You've got to give it discretion. Responsibility has to come with some, some sort of discretion. And so the more we can give autonomy and discretion and levers of power to the University of Memphis, probably the better for the university. It's also going to produce, you know, greater investments from local stakeholders because if the University of Memphis has, you know, more levers of power, if they're in control of the campus, then folks will be willing to yeah. invest in that campus. And so, you know, the University of Memphis has raised a great sum in the last year. Year. Yeah, uh, and I think they'll be able to fundraise even more 
the more control they have over that campus, and I think that's a good thing for our university. Is that proposal yeah. likely to pass? Ditto. Yes, it is. There will there will be some pushback on, on various areas. You know, you can always count on that, and you can only speculate what they might be. But this will affect the University of Memphis and five other universities. Austin it, P and, and right? Yeah, Tennessee State, TSU, and we can go through the yeah. list. But then there are 13 community colleges and 27 colleges of applied technology that will be... Um, the subject of greater focus because now you'll have the the board of regents sort of freed up to focus and that goes back to our um, workforce training and yeah. education initiatives that the, the push is coming through our TCATs the, the Tennessee Colleges of Applied Technology and the community colleges with this whole drive to 55 the Tennessee promise construct our, our leap program labor education alignment program has really shifted the paradigm and the pressure is on the, the TCATs and the community colleges to, to deliver. You know, enrollment uh, this past year was up about 24 percent, I think, at our TCATs, 20 percent at the community colleges or vice versa. And so we need the, the supervising board to focus on those, let these universities have more autonomy, as, yeah. as Lee says. Bill. In, in uh, talking with Brad Martin when he was the interim president of the University of Memphis, um, he indicated that the University of Memphis and other regents' universities, for lack of a better term, pretty much had been going in that direction. So it, it seems as if the shift is, is more of a game changer for the Board of Regents, but they've been devoting so much of their attention to the community colleges and the TCATs recently anyway. Yeah, um, it, it all makes sense. But it is it was a long time coming for the University of Memphis. I called Senator Curtis Person on my way home from the announcement uh, because Senator Person uh, was sort of a mentor to me when I started in the Senate back in 2000. And he told me about the importance of, of additional autonomy for for the University of Memphis at that time. So he was delighted to hear about all that. What happens then to, to state funding for higher education? It moves in a different path, obviously, uh, I would think. I'd say the path that it's been moving in, this past year we were finally able to fully fund the higher education formula, the BEP formula. It was at about an additional $26 million, which was of critical importance because it went along with that shift back in 2010 where we said, you know, we're not so interested in how many students you enroll anymore. We need to be looking at the end result, and that is how many you graduate and how well they're doing. Without that full funding at that level, we weren't really able to reward those who were performing. Without getting into too much detail, the formula was actually sort of punitive. So now we've done that, and we'll continue that in this next year, um, and, then, and then look at what additional capital expenses are needed. A lot of these TCATs are uh, undercapitalized in terms of having modern advanced manufacturing equipment on which to train, for example. And um, so it'll all, be, it'll all be much better, in my opinion. Talking about education, we'll shift a little bit to the local um, issues around the Shelby County School Board has said, uh, or some people with the Shelby County School Board have said, we don't want any more of our schools taken over by the ASD, the Achievement School District, which was put in place uh, some years ago by the Haslam administration, taking over underperforming schools, most of them in Memphis, a couple, one or two or three in Nashville. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, what is your take on that? They, Shelby County Schools could vote, they could yell, they could scream, they can't stop the ASD. It's a state law. The ASD can take over these schools. Um, do you think any adjustment needs to happen at the state level to the ASD rules? So I'm sympathetic to some of the some of the arguments I've heard um, from some of the folks you talked about. So, for example, they they pointed out that the I Zone school districts have been more, more successful than ASD, and I think that's true. And I think one of the reasons why the I Zones have been more successful under Shelby County Schools leadership is where the I Zones are getting more money, you know, to, yeah. more money. So the question is whether or not that kind of funding model is sustainable for education right. in Shelby County. And I think it points to that maybe there should be more investment in these high priority schools and high priority students. Because when we have more investment in those schools, yeah. like in the, in the I zone, for example, then you get better results. And so uh, I don't know if that's an indictment on the ASD and the ASD's work, but it does kind of point the path about what we should be doing and we should be maybe directing right. more resources to those high priority schools. Now, they, you know, as to the, the kind of the, the core point about whether or not we should do away with the ASD, I'm not in favor of that. I mean, I think that, you know, we've got to have some level of choice. Yeah. Uh, and I know sometimes that in my side of the aisle, that word choice can be um, 
you know, can create some anxiety. But the reality is, is that we've had, you know, we've had lots of schools and lots of school districts, and I'm a product of, of the school district here, that have not produced results. Right. And we've got to have a conversation about how to have high performance. <clears throat> and the ASD, for whatever, it, for whatever its warts, has produced a conversation about performance. So I'm, I'm upset yeah. that they haven't done as well as they should have. But I am uh, a little bit uh, encouraged that we're at least having a conversation right. about performance, and that's the, important. The outgoing head of the ASD, Chris Barwick, uh, who is done or about to be done, but has yeah. been there from the beginning, he and Dorsey Hobson, the head of the um, uh, local school system, were on talking about ISOM versus ASD, I think, in the summer. Chris Barwick said, look, it's, if nothing else, we, I'm a paraphrase, and he yeah. said it more eloquently than this, if nothing else, we provide competition. We are in co a healthy competition with yeah. the iZone, so if they're doing better than us, that's great. We're going to try to beat them next year. Yeah. Is that your take, that this competition that didn't exist for so long? Yeah, I think it's very is, healthy. Yeah. I think it's very healthy, and, and Senator Harris is, is absolutely right. Um, it's, it's all good, and the result, you know, we're, we're getting off rock bottom, but golly, Ned, we've got a long way to go, and yeah. it's a... It's of such critical importance. I mean, the, here in, in Shelby County, you know, the, the poverty rate is going in the opposite direction. I mean, we've gone up from, from what, 23 to 27 percent or from 24 to 27 yeah. percent, um, despite all these efforts. And both in education and in a lot of the Elia Mocenary organizations, we've got this proliferation of not-for-profits. seems like every year there are more and more, and their hearts are in the right place, and they're all pulling on the same oar, trying to help people get trained, get educated, get employed. Uh, and yet the, the poverty factor is going up. So we've got a lot of work to do, but these, these schools are of critical importance. Yeah. Bill, about five minutes left. So at what point should the state, in terms of its funding for education, to, to, to put it bluntly, pick a winner between a, the ASD and the I-Zone schools? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think the I-Zone schools has produced results in the ASD. I mean, we, you know, the jury's still out on a lot of these things because we haven't had the kind of, you know, five-year term, five year kind of review that we need to kind of see who's a winner and a loser. And I'm a little hesitant to call schools a competition. Mm -hmm. I think there is the conversation that needs to be had about performance. And the point is, I think I'd leave all these things in place. If I had, you know, uh, my, my, you know if I had full control of everything, I think that, what the lesson is is that we've got to figure out a way to finance schools a little bit different. The per people model may be a little outdated and may not be as helpful as we think it is because one thing that happens in Shelby County school system, as we all know, is that it creates a lot of financial instability. Uh, that from year to year, they've got to figure out how many ASD schools are going to be selected, you know, to become, you know, become under the leadership of charter operators, and that can, you know, create a lot of fires that they have to put out. And so maybe, maybe it's time to talk about a baseline funding for schools or the, you know, the public school system. If they had a baseline funding, of funding that they could guarantee from year to year, they'd have more stability and be able to program and plan. And they're not there yet. And so there's some problems. We need to have a conversation about financing. But I'm not ready to announce a winner or a loser, and I don't think that's the right kind of uh, analogy for the school system at all. I think we just need to have a conversation about performance, and a conversation about performance mm -hmm. means that you've got to have different kind of organizations out there. You've got to have an I-Zone, you've got to have a, a public school system, probably with guaranteed baseline funding, and you've got to have an ASD with charter operators and so forth so that the conversation continues. Well, Mark, in, in terms of volatility and, and, and unprecedented things happening, for the last five years, local public education here in Shelby County yeah. ha has really been the place to test some of the concepts that, that, that Lee's talking about. Yes. Um, so should there be a baseline funding that, that says we recognize that if a certain number of students are shifted to other school systems or to charters, that there is still a fixed cost for the school system that they come from. Yeah, I'm, I'm open to that concept. The, the governor has been working on looking at revisions to the BEP formula itself, uh, which is it's, it, it, it is an incredibly complicated formula, no matter who you talk to, even the best experts. Um, that might be the kind of thing that comes out of their report, which I hope we get here at the beginning of the session. Um, so, you know, I think all options are on the table, whatever it takes right. to improve their performance. I, I, there are always a lot of talk, and you remember this from your days on the city council, your time on the county commission, about pilots and tax incentives, TIFs, but really about the pilot program. Um, some people are going to go forward, uh, the, the chamber and, and others, I think, are going to go forward this year with a plan that they need different and better tools. As Memphis is a border city, they're competing with M Mississippi, which has kind of this blank check approach to incentives. They poach companies who can come across the border and take advantage of Memphis amenities, an issue we've talked about that's very controversial. 
are there adjustments, changes, additional tools that cities need, Memphis specifically, in this economic development fight with Arkansas, Mississippi, and other states around the country? Well, well you know, me personally, I think we need to re rethink the whole poly system. I think there are a lot of problems with it. Right. Uh, and I don't know if we're going to have time to get into that. That's a, that's a whole other show. Right. But as far as the state assembly is concerned, I think that the state assembly, the folks in the state assembly, the vast majority of them, uh, are going to support whatever proposal comes out of local government. If local right. government makes a proposal that's halfway credible and halfway reasonable about what tools it'll need to draw right. companies <clears throat> and recruit businesses, I think that you can expect the general assembly to be totally supportive. It's just a question of you know, them making the proposal and making right. the case. Your, your thoughts on that? I mean, what, what tools, uh, we don't have a lot of time left and it's incredibly complicated, but it's, it is different for Memphis to compete against Missis Mississippi than Nashville to That's compete right. against That's right. a city, you know, because that border issue is huge. Chattanooga faces some of the same issues. Yeah, actually one of the ways we're competing with those other states is, is not through additional incentives per se, but through a better trained workforce and the fact that we've created a pipeline of skilled workers, and, and that actually has been a great selling card, but I, I agree with Senator Harris, we'd have to have a separate program. I'll put you on the spot with 30 seconds left. Some folks in your party have, have come out strongly against the state of Tennessee, um, accepting refugees, Syrian refugees, I mean, after the whole San Bernardino thing. Your take on, on where we are as a state in terms of refugees. I, I don't know how much time we have left. <laughs> not enough. Our primary, <laughs> responsibility, seconds, primary responsibility under the Constitution is to provide for the peace, safety, and happiness of the people of Tennessee. That's in the initial Declaration of Rights. That's our focus. Right now, the federal government, according to testimony by Commissioner Gibbons last week, is not collaborating with the State Department okay. of Homeland Security the way it needs to for us to understand what's going on. We need to give reassurance to okay. the people of Tennessee that we're going to take care of that. Okay. I didn't give me enough time for that, but thank you. Thank you both. Thank you for being here. Lee Harris, Bill Drees, thanks. Join us again next week. Yuletide Office Solutions, locally owned and family operated, offering office supplies and furniture, office design services, school supplies, and more. The Yuletide team proudly supports the Bartlett Area Chamber of Commerce and WKNO.